All right, well, let's go ahead and get started. I think we've got a relatively full room here and it's 12 o'clock. So I want to welcome everybody to Medical Grand Rounds at the University of Colorado. Um, really pleased that we are back in person. I would say uh, even on a snowy day, I'm this is like 100% full. So I love it. This is great. Uh, but we will continue to broadcast via Zoom for the rest of the year so that people can uh, attend remotely. A little bit of a teaser, upcoming talks on February 1st, we have Dr. Uh, Kirsten Lee Johnson, uh, Johansson, sorry, who will be the 2023 Wallstrom Invited Lecturer this year. And then on February 8th, we're going to hear from doctors, uh, Dr. Gabby Frank and uh, Casey Bowden discussing the power of interdisciplinary teams and how to harness that in our hospitals. Just as a reminder, uh, all of our medical grand rounds are open for CME and MOC credit, so go ahead and scan that. Um, and our questions will come primarily from our live audience today, but also uh, thank you to the chief residents for monitoring the Q&A feature on Zoom. So feel free to put things in Zoom if you're watching remotely. Uh, and now I am very pleased to welcome today's speaker, Dr. Anna Jovanovich. Uh, Dr. Jovanovich is an associate professor of medicine in the renal section at the Rocky Mountain Regional VA Medical Center and in the Division of Renal Diseases and Hypertension at the University of Colorado. She did her undergraduate work, undergraduate work at Lewis and Clark College, where she graduated with honors. She was a medical student at the University of Minnesota, and then she did her internship, residency, and fellowship uh, all with us here at the University of Colorado and obtained advanced, an advanced degree in the Master's of Science uh, through our uh, CCTSI. Dr. Jovanovich is a renowned researcher and educator on many aspects of renal disease. Her areas of scholarship and research are in phosphate lowering in CKD, as well as in the role of deoxycholic acid and outcomes in renal diseases over time. Her, in addition to her impressive uh, novel research efforts, she also lectures locally and nationally on a really wide range of topics. Uh, it was very fun to read her CV, covering both the acute and chronic diseases, uh, aspects of renal diseases. These include the use of biomarkers in kidney disease, uh, acute kidney injury, various interventions in both acute and chronic renal diseases, including and in, uh, in addition to her original research. Uh, she also is really known for her ability to explain things uh, very well to other services. And so a lot of her lecture work is done uh, in bone health, in renal cardiac interactions, and in renal pulmonary diseases. She's currently supported by several VA awards, uh, including a career development award. Uh, she has a co-pilot award from the CCTSI. Uh, she also is supported by the Ludeman Center for Women's Health uh, Research and another bit of support from the Colorado Specialized Center for Research Excellence in Sex Differences. Her work has led to 38 original manuscripts and over 100 abstracts, posters, and presentations. She's a national leader. She chairs the Early Career Committee Council on Kidney and Cardiovascular Disease for the American Heart Association, and she's one of the senior editors of Clinical Nephrology. I will also say she's a renowned educator and a really remarkable mentor, and has mentored over 15 fellows, residents, and students uh, in her short time on faculty. And so I will save the other pages I have here because they could take up all the rest of the time. But I want to introduce Dr. Jovanovich to give us updates in nephrology. Thank you, Dr. Connors, for the kind introduction. And thank you to the Department of Medicine and Dr. Chopra for the invitation to speak with you all today. Um, all right, so I will be giving updates in nephrology today. This talk has not been given um, since December of 2019, when life was much different. <laughs> I have nothing to disclose. And these are the objectives for the talk, to review new research in kidney disease, to describe the implementation of new and existing therapies in kidney disease, and to discuss the impact and future direction of kidney disease management. So I'm kind of biased, but nephrology has always been a fabulous field. We take care of the sickest patients in the hospital. We develop long-term relationships with patients in the clinic and who need dialysis. And we also participate in transplant care. And there is nothing better than to see a bag full of yellow urine after a kidney transplant in a person who's been on dialysis and is aneuric. But I would argue that today it's even better uh, to be a nephrologist because um, research in nephrology is exploding and it's really an exciting time. Um, we have new research in autosomal dominant polycystic cystic disease, looking at SGLT2 inhibitors and um, 
fasting and um, the role obesity plays. Um, there's growing treatments and diagnostics in glomerular nephritis. Um, there's a big and growing literature on disparities. And this was covered by Dr. Jessica Kendrick um, in February of 2021, which included the um, uh, taking out race in the GFR equation, which was a, a, a really um, big step forward. Um, there's always new and exciting research in transplant. Um, the field of genetics in kidney disease is growing. We're still about 10 years behind um, cancer, but um, we are catching up. Um, there are new therapies in dialysis or for dialysis patients to improve their quality of life, such as for uremic puritis. Um, and then there are new therapies as you guys um, have already implemented in your clinics in chronic kidney disease. And there's also some new um, and exciting research in acute kidney injury. And I'm going to focus today on chronic kidney disease and acute kidney injury, because I think these are what you as general internists and uh, medicine, subspecialists, medicine subspecialists interface with the most. This was a hard talk to put together because I tried to cover the literature between um, January of 2020 to December of 2022, which is three years. Um, and there's just a lot of really quality data out there. So I've chosen to focus on um, aldosterone antagonism in CKD, um, inhibition of the renin angiotensin system in advanced CKD, and thiazide diuretics for hypertension in advanced CKD. And then in acute kidney injury, I don't have a unifying theme, but we're gonna look at treatment of hepatorenal syndrome um, and renal replacement therapy timing in AKI. So let's uh, start with chronic kidney disease. So um, CKD is prevalent worldwide and in the United States. Um, there are more than 800 million people with chronic kidney disease in the world. That's one in 10. In the United States, the prevalence is 15, 14 to 15%, depending on what year you look at it. And this is stubbornly stable. Um, CKD is more prevalent in individuals with diabetes, in women, in individuals with hypertension, in racial minorities, and in older adults. In fact, um, diabetes is the most important risk factor in chronic kidney disease in the developed world. And it's estimated that more than 40% of individuals with diabetes will eventually develop CKD. So um, deaths attributed to CKD are increasing and have increased nearly 42% between 1990 and 2017 worldwide. And it's projected that in 2040, CKD will be the fifth leading cause of death in the world. Um, Cardiovascular disease is um, one of the leading causes of death in CKD. Um, and death rates and cardiovascular disease events increase progressively as GFR falls. In this cohort of over a million patients and nearly three years of follow-up, more patients with CKD died than progressed to dialysis or kidney transplant. And decreased GFR independent of traditional cardiovascular risk factors predicted um, decreased survival. And so you can see more than 14,000 um, patients died and only um, 3,500 required renal replacement therapy. Um, but let's not lose hope. We have this great body of growing quality research. In um, 2020, the Kidney Disease Improving Global Outcomes, or KDGO, which is our main body that um, produces guidelines uh, for nephrology, um, published the Clinical Practice Guideline for Diabetes Management and Chronic Kidney Disease. This guideline needed to be updated two years later because of all the um, 
really exciting and quality research with good outcomes um, for treatments um, in people with diabetic kidney disease and proteinuric kidney disease. So the SGLT2 inhibitors and GLP-1 receptor agonists. And I'm not even gonna talk about these drugs today because you already know these are beneficial to patients with chronic kidney disease. Because when, they, when these patients come to my clinic, they're already on empagliflozin and semaglutide, which are the two drugs we have at the VA. So congratulations, give yourselves a pat on the back. And thank you. I am gonna talk about aldosterone antagonism and diabetic uh, kidney disease. So just a little bit of a reminder for those of you who don't think about aldosterone and the um, principal cell every day. Um, aldosterone binds to the intracellular mineralocorticoid receptor and um, increases renal sodium retention, urinary potassium loss, and causes increases in blood pressure. The main stimuli for aldosterone are angiotensin II, corticotropin, and potassium. Um, nitric oxide, endothelin, pituitary factors, and adipose tissue factors also can um, stimulate aldosterone. And CKD um, actually can cause a mild hyperaldosteronism. So if you have CKD, just by the fact that you have CKD, you might have more aldosterone on board, contributing to more sodium retention and more um, hypertension. Aldosterone is deleterious in cardiovascular and kidney diseases. Um, aldosterone increases oxidative stress. Um, causing increase in pro-inflammatory transcription factors and decrease in nitric oxide um, availability. And this affects macrophages, cardiomyocytes, and vascular smooth muscle cells, which causes cardiac fibrosis, left, or, um, cardiac hypertrophy, um, hypertension, and endothelial dysfunction. Aldosterone also activates the map erc pathway, which increases um, fibroblast production, which in the kidney can cause tubular interstitial fibrosis, podocyte effacement, mesangial injury, matrix expansion, and proximal tubule injury. That's CKD. Phenarinone is a newer third generation non-steroidal selective mineralocorticoid receptor antagonist. I'm gonna say MRA. Um, it induces conformational, ch conformational changes in the mineralocorticoid receptor as opposed to um, binding the MR binding ligand domain, which is how spironolactone and aplerinone work. Um, lower rates of hyperkalemia have been noted with phenarinone. Um, hyperkalemia, especially in people with kidney disease, it's one of the limiting factors for using um, spironolactone and aplerinone in these patients. Um, and it's conjectured that um, steroidal um, MRAs like spironolactone and aplerinone accumulate three to six fold more in the kidney than the heart, but that's in a rat. Um, and that Phenarinone potentially um, accumulates equivalently between the kidney and the heart. Um, and so maybe that's why there's less of an effect on hyperkalemia. Again, um, we don't have data from humans. Um, because of the deleterious effects of um, aldosterone on the kidney and heart, and because phenarinone may be associated with decreased hyperkalemia, the Fidelio DKD trial was conducted uh, with the objective to determine whether phenarinone slows CKD progression and reduces cardiovascular mortality um, and morbidity among individuals with advanced chronic kidney disease and type 2 diabetes. Um, it was a phase three randomized double blind placebo controlled multicenter trial. Um, and it er enrolled adults with CKD and type 2 diabetes on the max tolerated ACE or ARB with a serum potassium that was uh, less than 4.8. And there were two CKD criteria. 
one with a lower um, urine albumin to creatinine ratio and a lower GFR plus diabetic retinopathy. You can see criteria one. And then one with more significant albuminuria up to um, a urine albumin creatinine ratio of 5,000, but allowed a slightly higher GFR of um, up to less than 75. The primary endpoint was a composite of kidney failure sustained um, greater than 40% decrease in GFR for more than four weeks or death from re renal causes. And I just wanna point out a few of the baseline characteristics that are probably quite small for you to see. But the mean age was around 65. Um, there were more men than women. There were few black patients. Um, hemoglobin A1C was 7.7 .7 and blood pressure, um, systolic blood pressure was 138. The mean GFR in the group was um, 44. The urine albumin to creatinine ratio was 852, so just under about one gram. The serum potassium was 4.3, and um, about 7% were taking GLP-1 agonists, and 5% um, were taking SGLT2 inhibitors. And more than 5,000 patients were randomized to either finerenone or placebo and followed for a median of 2.6 years. And um, this shows the primary composite outcome. There was a significant difference between finerenone and placebo and um, favoring finerenone in a decrease in the primary composite outcome of kidney failure, 40% um, decrease in GFR or death from renal causes. Um, the number needed to treat for, 40, for over three years to prevent one of these outcomes was 29. Um, there was no difference um, when we look, when we um, separate the, out the composite endpoints, um, really only two people in each group died from renal causes. So that, um, that kind of didn't factor into this. But this primary composite outcome was mostly driven by this um, reduced decrease in GFR and less so by actual kidney failure. There was also a significant difference in the secondary composite outcome of cardiovascular endpoints. So death, oh, did we disappear? <laughs> okay, it's back. Um, death from cardiovascular causes, non-fatal um, MI, non-fatal stroke, and hospitalization from heart failure. The number needed to treat to prevent one of these episodes was 42 over three years. These weren't as robust as the SGLT2 inhibitors. Um, it was noted that um, the urine albumin to creatinine ratio decreased by um, more than 30% in the finerenone group. Um, and potassium did increase in the finerenone group by about um, 0.2. Um, so I'm going to stop there and then go on to talk about the Figaro DKD study, um, which was published about a year later. Um, this, oops. Should I just, okay, I think I got it. Oops, now it's gone again. Okay, can I go on? Okay. Um, So 
this trial um, aimed to determine whether finerenone lowered the risk of cardiovascular events and death from CV causes among individuals with less severe kidney function or less severe kidney disease. Um, it was a randomized double-blind placebo-controlled trial. And adults with CKD and type 2 um, diabetes on max-tolerated ACE with a potassium of less than 4.8 um, were recruited. And you can see that the CKD criteria um, were a little bit more liberal than the Fidelio DKD. Um, they allowed a GFR up to 90 in the more mild proteinuria group. And um, in the more severe proteinuria group, they um, enrolled a GFR of greater than 60. And the primary composite endpoint for this study was um, death from CV causes, non-fatal MI, non-fatal stroke, or hospitalization for a heart failure. Um, a total of more than 7,000 participants were randomized. Um, the baseline characteristics were very similar to Fidelio DKD, but the GFR was higher and the um, urine albumin to creatinine ratio was lower. Um, importantly, they excluded individuals with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, and they followed these participants for more than three years. So just a short take. Um, there was a, a significant difference between placebo and finerenone. Um, those treated with finerenone did have a decrease in the cardiovascular composite endpoint. The number needed to treat over 3.5 years to um, prevent one of these events was 47. And interestingly, even though um, the study criteria um, excluded participants with heart failure, it was hospitalization for heart failure that really drove the reduction in cardiovascular endpoints. Um, there, in terms of the um, secondary endpoints, um, none of them were statistically significant, but the hazard ratios all favored finerenone. Um, and when the kidney composite outcome had um, was defined with a decrease of almost 60% in GFR, there was a slight um, significant um, difference or benefit in being treated with finerenone. In both trials, there were obviously adverse events. Um, in both trials, any adverse event occurred equally in both groups, but adverse events related to the trial occurred more often in the treatment group in both trials. And adverse events leading to discontinuation of the trial occurred in the finerenone group in Fidelio. Um, and one of the drivers of this treatment-related um, trial adverse event rate was hyperkalemia in both groups. So even though we think that finerenone maybe is better for hyperkalemia, there still is a risk of hyperkalemia leading to even trial discontinuation. There was no difference between the groups and in the two trials in the rate of AKI. So to sum, finerenone slows kidney disease progression and decreases cardiovascular outcomes among individuals with diabetic kidney disease. It may be added to first-line therapy in individuals with high residual risk of kidney disease progression and cardiovascular events. So people with proteinuria after they're on max, mass, max dose ACE and their blood pressure is controlled. I'm just going to keep talking. Um, but we need to remember to um, carefully monitor for hyperkalemia. It was noted that after the RALS trial, there was a much higher rate in kind of the general population of hyper, uh, a higher rate of hyperkalemia in kind of the general clinic population, which is different than patients who participate in a study. Um, there are some new secondary analyses that suggest that finerenone does have a modest blood pressure lowering effect, but that only accounts for about 12% of the benefit, um, suggesting that really it's the um, 
inhibition of aldosterone and its downstream effects on the heart and kidney that has the most benefit. Um, other considerations are that um, phenarinone is expensive. It's greater than $600 for a month. Um, and we have to be cognizant of polypharmacy. Moving on to the renin-angiotensin system, I'm gonna call it RAS. Um, you all know that the renin-angiotensin system, when it's activated, causes hypertension, um, renal sodium and water reabsorption, and glomerular hyperfiltration. It also causes aldosterone excretion. And then as we reviewed before, this can uh, stimulate inflammation and oxidative stress. When the RAS system is inhibited, um, the adverse effects on the heart and kidney are reduced. So there's less cardiac hypertrophy, less cardiac fibrosis, um, there's a decrease in intraglomerular pressure in the kidney, which leads to a reduced proteinuria, which is beneficial. Um, but there is some hyperkalemia. Nonetheless, treatment with RAS inhibition improves cardiovascular outcomes and slows especially proteinuric chronic kidney disease. However, it's uncertain whether the benefits of RAS inhibition in advanced chronic kidney disease are actually there. Um, when people have a very low GFR, sometimes we take off their ACE or ARB to give them back GFR. We think maybe they'll feel better. Um, there's also a safety concern in the setting of increased risk of hyperkalemia with a low GFR. In that setting, the STOP ACE trial was conducted. The objective was to assess whether the discontinuation of RAS inhibitors increased or stabilized GFR among individuals with advanced and progressive CKD. This was a multi-center randomized open label trial conducted in the UK. Um, it enrolled adults with CKD four to five, so that's a GFR of less than 30, but not on dialysis or no kidney transplant. And they had to have a decrease in their GFR of greater, greater than two mils per minute in the previous two years, which is, shows per, like a faster progression of their kidney disease. And they had to be on an ACE or an ARB. And the primary endpoint was an eGFR um, at three years. Um, more than 400 people were randomized. Um, into the RAS inhibitor discontinuation group or the RAS inhibitor continuation group. And the groups were fairly well matched. Um, the age, or half were less than 65, more were men, many, many more were white, few were black. Um, interestingly, six, more than 60% did not have diabetes. Um, the systolic blood pressure was in the mid 130s. Um, the GFR was 18. This is pretty advanced chronic kidney disease. Here, these people would be getting fistulas and be listed for a transplant. Um, potassium was five, um, and the median protein to creatinine ratio was about one. So these are some very, pretty sick CKD patients. So after three years, there was no difference between the groups in GFR. Though I do want to note that the um, GFR in the continuation group, those who remained on their RAS blockade, had a, a numerically higher GFR. Um, there was no difference in subgroup analysis, though the hazard ratios tended to favor continuation, except in type 1 diabetes. And then we see a similar um, trend in the secondary outcome of reaching renal replacement therapy, so dialysis, or end-stage kidney disease, which was defined as a greater than 50% decrease in GFR. So only 63% of the continuation group had reached this endpoint, and 68% in the discontinuation had reached this point. So 
it wasn't statistically significant, but numerically it was better to be in the continuation group. They also looked at some other secondary endpoints. There was no difference in hospitalization between the discontinuation versus the continuation. And you can see the numbers 414 to 413. I'm gonna skip to the end. Similarly with death, there was really no difference 20 versus 22. And there's no statistical difference in cardiovascular events, but there were more numerically in the discontinuation group at 108 versus 88 in the continuation group. So stop ACE has some big limitations. There's concern about generalizability. Um, of more than 1,000 that were eligible, only 411 were randomized. There was a high withdrawal rate um, at three years, 20% withdrew, and more withdrew in the continuation group. There were few people with diabetic nephropathy, and few people were non-white. Um, and the median age was 63. And while the range is, is broad, um, most of the people were in their mid-60s, so left out young and old. Um, and this trial excluded individuals with a history of clinically um, important side effects with RAS inhibitors. So these people who had problems with RAS inhibitors were probably already off of them, so weren't even eligible for the study. This trial was initiated in 2014, so there was little use of SGLT2 inhibitors and GLP-1 agonists. And really, the, um, the proteinuria levels were rather low. A, a, a UPC level of about one is not great, but it's not that bad either in some pa in some patient. And there there weren't even there wasn't even a single participant with nephrotic range proteinuria. So the stop ACE, um, I have a summer, summary, and then it leaves some questions. So um, stopping RAS inhibitors in advanced CKD conferred little benefit and may have been associated with some adverse effects. And it didn't give GFR back. Less stopping RAS inhibitors to give GFR back and maybe make a person feel better um, was disproven. Um, if, so the questions that this study brings up are, if there is a, a risk of RAS inhibitor, or if the risk of use of RAS inhibitors is deemed too high, can SGLT2 inhibitors and GLP-1 agonists be sufficient for renal protection, especially in diabetic kidney disease? And can newer therapies for hyperkalemia like Lopelma and Petirimer um, mitigate the risks of hyperkalemia associated with RAS inhibition? And when you're sitting in front of a patient, you have to ask yourself, does stop ACE apply to my patient? And in the end, you just have to discuss the risks and benefits. And really, in this case, shared decision-making is very important. Let's move on to thiazide diuretics for hypertension in advanced kidney disease. So this quote is taken directly from a paper written by a nephrologist. For as long as thiazides have been in clinical use, there has been concern that they may be ineffective in advanced CKD. And the reason for this is that the sodium chloride channel, which is blocked by thiazide diuretics, is in the um, distal convoluted tubule and is only responsible for about 5% of sodium reabsorption. And in the setting of advanced CKD with a very low GFR, this is thought to be not a very um, significant effect on sodium reabsorption. So blocking it probably has very little diuretic effect. The thing about um, thiazides though, is that there's a thought that they um, contribute to vasodilatation independent of their diuretic effect, and through possibly a direct action to um, potassium channels in the smooth muscle, like vascular smooth muscle cells. So um, there have been many, many very small randomized controlled trials and crossover trials it, looking at chlorothaladone and HCTZ and advanced CKD um, with variable results. And it was in this setting that the CLIC trial was conducted. 
The objective of the CLICK trial was to determine whether chlorthalidone would decrease 24-hour ambulatory systolic blood pressure among individuals with advanced CKD. Um, this was a double-blind randomized placebo-controlled trial um, that enrolled adults with CKD stage four, so GFR between 15 and 30, who had uncontrolled hypertension, which was defined as a blood pressure of greater than 130 over 80, um, on a 24-hour ambulatory blood pressure monitoring um, for two weeks after antihypertensives had been adjusted um, to a standard protocol. And the primary endpoint was change in ambulatory systolic blood pressure after 12 weeks. And so this is the study design. Um, patients were screened in that baseline week and then entered a run-in uh, run phase where they received placebo and their blood pressure regimen was titrated um, to be on either lisinopril or losartan or atenolol, and then other blood pressure med medicines were titrated. If they were still hypertensi hypertensive, meaning a blood pressure greater than 130 over 80, they were randomized to receive either um, chlorthalidone or placebo, and then followed for um, 12 weeks. Every four weeks, they came in for a visit and um, their chlorthalidone was adjusted or increased if their blood pressure was greater than 135 over um, greater than 85. These are some selected baseline characteristics that I think are important. Again, similar to all the other trials I've talked about today, um, age was in the mid 60s. Most were men. Um, there, a little more than 50% were white and 40% were black. Um, diabetes um, was prevalent in 70, mid 70s in each group. Systolic blood pressure at baseline was around 140. GFR was uh, around 23 and urine albumin to creatinine ratio was 862, so close to one. This is very run-of-the-mill chronic kidney disease that we would see at the VA. Um, so uh, just wanna show you, 81 were randomized to chlorthalidone and 79 were randomized to placebo. 88% um, completed the trial, so 140 out of 160 that were um, randomized. And this still gave 80% power to, to, de to detect a difference. Um, the mean dose of chlorthalidone after 12 weeks was about 23, and the placebo dose was 37. Um, systolic blood pressure at, randomiza at randomization was 142 in the chlorthalidone group and 140 in the placebo group. And if the participant was randomized to chlorthalidone, there was a significant reduction in ambulatory systolic blood pressure, um, a difference of 10.5 between groups and a, um, a, a total change in blood pressure in the chlorthalidone group of 11 millimeters of mercury. That's a big deal. Um, up on top is... Um, uh, shows you the um, the clinic, um, sorry, the seated um, systolic blood pressure, important for translating this to clinical settings because it's very hard to do ambulatory blood pressure monitoring. There was a difference between groups. Below that on the left is um, change in body weight. Um, so you can see that the placebo group remains stable and the chlorothalidone weight was reduced a little bit, suggesting a diuretic effect. BNP was also decreased and renin was increased, showing that there was some diuretic effect. Um, to your right, you will see the reduction in urine albumin to creatinine ratio. So there was a percent, um, percent point difference of 50% um, favoring chlorthalidone. This was kind of an unexpected and um, exciting finding. And then um, you can see also that chlorthalidone, the GFR was reduced, but after chlorthalidone was stopped, um, increased back to baseline, suggesting also some hemo hemodynamic effects. 
There were more adverse events in the chlorothaladone group. Um, specifically, there was an increase um, in serum creatinine level of greater than 25% of baseline um, in the chlorothaladone chlorthalidone group, about 45% of the chlorthalidone had an increase in their baseline creatinine. This was more common in individuals who are also treated with a loop diuretic. And I do want to tell you that 60% of the total cohort was treated with a loop diuretic, and they gave chlorthalidone on top of that. There was some hypokalemia and some hyponatremia more in the chlorthalidone group, but nothing, 11% compared to 8% for hyponatremia and 10% for hypokalemia compared to zero in the placebo group. But nothing that would, you know, I think we worry a lot about um, blocking the entire tubule, but maybe we don't need to so much. Um, so to summarize, chlorothaladone reduces ambulatory systolic blood pressure and proteinuria among individuals with CKD stage four. Um, it reduces proteinuria, and this suggests a target organ protection, which, you know, if we do other trials, there may be some reduction in cardiovascular outcomes, which are, is important for this group. Um, there are con definitely concerns about safety in terms of electrolytes and changes in serum creatinine, um, so it warrants close monitoring. But I also, <laughs> I also want to tell you, we already monitor patients with chronic kidney disease stage four and proteinuria closely. This is a group at very high risk for progression. And so I don't see how this would, at least for a nephrologist, change practice so much. Um, this is an extremely generalizable study. Um, this um, study was conducted in Indianapolis and recru recruited from three hospitals, a VA, a hospital that serves um, underserved populations and a university hospital. Um, some limitations are that the number included was small, but they still um, enrolled enough participants to achieve their power. Um, there were very few women and few Asian and Hispanic participants. So this is a slide to conclude um, these um, studies on CKD. So if our goal in the treatment of uh, chronic kidney disease is to reduce kidney disease progression and reduce cardiovascular disease morbidity and mortality, I think these studies set us on a good course. Fidelio DKD and Figaro DKD support venerinone and diabetic kidney disease. Um, uh, individuals with diabetes um, have a higher prevalence of CKD. The STOP ACE trial suggests no benefit to discontinuing RAS inhibition and leaves the possibility that RAS inhibition may benefit um, people with advanced CKD in terms of cardiovascular disease and progression. Um, and then the CLIC trial supports use of chlorthalidone as an effective antihypertensive in advanced CKD with possible antiproteinuric and possibly cardiovascular effects. And again, individuals with hypertension um, have a higher prevalence of CKD. However, there are three of five groups with a high prevalence of CKD that were pretty much to different degrees uh, left out of these trials. There were fewer women enrolled, fewer people of color, and fewer older adults. So we need to do better. Moving on to acute kidney injury. We're almost there. Um, so I call this a potpourri because I don't really have a unifying um, theme, but I thought these two trials are the biggest trials in AKI in the past three years and probably even a little bit longer than that. And, I, and one of them in particular has the, um, has the potential to change practice. So let's talk about hepatorenal syndrome and acute kidney injury, um, HRS AKI and terlipressin. So AKI and decompensated cirrhosis is bad. So I'm just talking about any AKI. Um, and there is a high prevalence of any AKI in cirrhotic patients. Um, the 30-day mortality 
in a person with cirrhosis and AKI can be as high as 44%, and this is terrible. Hepatorenal syndrome is a type of AKI that these um, patients can experience. And there, with new um, um, hepatology guidelines, there's new terminology for HRS, and it's HRS AKI. And this is an AKI unique to individuals with cirrhosis, absent hypovolemia, and absent significant kidney histology abnormalities. And this is taken from the new guidelines published in 2021 um, for how to diagnose HRS AKI. So um, in this new diagnostic scheme, AKI is defined as a serum creatinine increase of greater than or equal to 0.3 in 48 hours or a greater than or equal to 50% increase in serum creatinine over the past seven days. There can't be any improvement after two consecutive days of diuretic withdrawal and volume expansion with albumin. Um, shock has to be absent, and um, there can't be any current or recent use of nephrotoxic drugs, usually contrast or NSAIDs. And there can't be any signs of structural kidney injury. So you got to get a nephrology consult. And we will help you look for proteinuria of greater than 500 milligrams per day and microhematuria of greater than 50 uh, RBCs per high power field and or abnormal renal ultrasound results. The treatment for HRS AKI is... Um, vasoconstrictor therapy until the serum creatinine returns to baseline or treatment for greater than or equal to 14 days. So that's a long time. In Europe, um, terlipressin, which allows for intermittent dosing through the IV on the floor, has been used for years. Um, in the United States, we use a continuous um, infusion of norepinephrine um, but the person has to be admitted to the ICU with invasive monitoring and a central line um, and um, or nitidrin and octreotide on the floor, which that efficacy is, is terrible. And nitidrin and octreotide for HRS are used off-label. And then renal replacement therapy should only be used as a bridge to liver transplant. So terlipressin is a synthetic vasopressin analog of the natural hormone lysine vasopressin. It's a prodrug that is converted to lysine vasopressin. And this prodrug hangs around for a long time and then can be constituently um, uh, transformed into lysine vasopressin so that lysine vasopressin is effectively active for 180 to 240 minutes whereas vasopressin is, um, has a half-life of less than 20 minutes. So this is why we don't use vasopressin in HRS. Um, compared to vasopressin, um, lysine vasopressin has two times the affinity for the V1 receptor, which is found on the vasculature. Um, so all of these things together make terlipressin um, have a greater pharmacodynamic selectivity and extended pharmacokinetic action leading um, to the ability to dose it intermittently and then expect a more reliable clinical effect. Um, so um, we, I guess, we in the United States have been trying to um, get terlipressin approved by the FDA since like 2009. Um, and two small trials um, have been conducted, um, but haven't received FDA approval. So the confirmed trial was um, conducted and published a year ago. Um, the objective was to confirm the efficacy and safety of terlipressin plus albumin as compared to placebo um, in adults with cirrhosis and HRS. And this uh, study was uh, conducted and designed um, with the FDA. Um, it was a two-to-one um, randomized double-blind placebo-controlled trial with um, two receiving terlipressin to one receiving placebo. 
Um, in adults with cirrhosis, ascites and a doubling of serum creatinine to between 2.25 and 7 within 14 days prior to their randomization. The primary endpoint was verified HRS reversal. Um, and these are the table one demographics. I just want to point out that um, most of the causes of liver disease was cirrhosis. The serum creatinine was quite high at 3.5, and the albumin level was also very high at 3.7 in the terlipressin group and 4 in the um, placebo group. And this suggests that the patients had already undergone, undergone um, lots of volume resuscitation. Um, so this shows the primary and secondary endpoints, and I'm going to focus on the primary endpoint. So there was um, there were more clinical successes in the terlipressin group than the placebo group, and fewer clinical failures. And so it was considered that this trial reached its primary endpoint, which was reversal of um, HRS. Um, it wasn't powered to detect a difference in survival, but there were more patients who died um, taking terlipressin than placebo, and there were more deaths due to respiratory failure in the first 14 days. Um, and that's concerning because that 14 days was when they were receiving the terlipressin. So it seemed like there was some effect of terlipressin um, causing the respiratory failure and even death. And so even though the FDA design, helped design this trial, um, on the initial application, they said no again. Um, the, this is a table of um, important adverse events. Overall, there was no difference in adverse events between terlipressin and placebo, um, but there were more adverse events leading to trial discontinuation in terlipressin. And, um, the majority of these um, important adverse events were respiratory failure. So let's talk about the confirmed pitfalls. Um, so alcohol was one of the main causes of cirrhosis in this study. It's a little tricky because um, if we need to bridge these patients to transplant, a, a lot of them aren't at the stage that they can be bridged to transplant because they're just too sick. Um, there, were a, there was a high rate of adverse events, especially respiratory complications with terlipressin. Um, and that is thought to be due to the fact that these patients were already volume repleted, so they had a high preload, and then we gave them terlipressin, so we increased their afterload, and that caused some pulmonary edema. Um, the trial enrolled, enrolled patients with very high serum creatinine and albumin values. This may not be what we see in, in our patients. Um, and there was no difference in death, even though it wasn't powered to detect this endpoint. And interestingly, there were fewer, at 30 days, there were fewer liver transplants with terlipressin, which you may think would be the opposite. And they, they didn't check MELDs right before the liver transplant. So no one knows if it was because maybe the people waiting for the liver transplant died on terlipressin or because terlipressin caused a decrease in their MELD score and then they were bumped lower on the, the list. So that's, that's a pretty big pitfall. Um, so in order for the FDA to approve this drug, they combined the um, outcomes with the two other trials that had attempted to get FDA approval. And combining all these trials, there was an improvement in mortality. Uh, and then interestingly, the two other trials didn't have an increased risk of respiratory failure. It was only the confirmed trial. So the FDA approved terlipressin this past September. So to summarize, terlipressin is better than placebo for HRS AKI reversal. Um, there's possibly better survival when we pull results of three trials, but it is very expensive on the order of $5,000 a day. Um, 
if we use it, there needs to be careful and ongoing volume assessment to avoid respiratory failure, um, use of point of care ultrasound, and um, maybe even initiation at a lower serum creatinine and albumin values might help mitigate this risk. That's all I have for terlopressin. It's under review at the VA and the university. And I've been told at Denver Health that a drug has to be on the market for a year to be considered. So stay tuned. <clears throat> All right, I'm at my final um, trial. So um, renal replacement therapy, timing and AKI. So it's been this ongoing debate um, probably between nephrologists and the rest of the hospital, whether it's better to start renal replacement early or later, like when there's an indication such as hyperkalemia or um, bad acidosis or respiratory failure, which is what the nephrologist would do. So early versus standard. And there are risks and benefits to both. So if you start early, you could mitigate fluid accumulation reduce exposure to the metabolic hazards of acute kidney injury, and even restore acid-base balance before it gets way off whack or way off target. But if you start early, you have a risk of the line placement and the actual dialysis procedure itself. Um, and you actually may be providing a therapy that's unnecessary because some of these patients who are starting early without an, a really strong indication may recover which is always the hope of the renal fellow at one in the morning. Um, so in this, so there were a lot of smaller trials and observational studies that showed really conflicting results. There was really, we didn't have any data to guide us, even though we kind of had an idea, at least I think nephrologists did. So in this setting, the START AKI trial was conducted. So the objective was to determine whether accelerated initiation versus standard initiation, um, RRT and AKI resulted in a lower 90-day mortality. It was a multinational randomized open-label control trial, um, enrolled adults with stage two or three AKI, and the attending physician had to affirm that there was clinical equipoise to starting RRT. So there had to be no firm indication to not start it or to start it. And um, the primary endpoint was death at 90 days. So um, about 3,000 patients were randomized. If you were randomized to the accelerated strategy, then after randomization, RRT was to be initiated as soon as possible and within 12 hours. Um, if you were randomized to the standard strategy, then um, AKI or RRT was initiated at the discretion of the attending and usually for the AEIO use. Um, the baseline characteristics were similar between groups. Um, and this slide shows um, the um, how RRT was initiated in the accelerated group in blue and the standard group in red. So in the accelerated group, RRT was initiated within six hours and almost 97% of participants in that group received renal replacement therapy. As opposed to, as opposed to the standard group, um, RRT was initiated at a median of 31 hours. So like more than a day later after randomization, and only 62% of that group actually initiated or needed RRT. Um, and 66% of those that started RRT met one of those AEIOUs. Um, not surprisingly, they seemed sicker by their numbers, their SOFA scores, their creatinines, BONs were higher, and they had more fluid on board. Nonetheless, there was no difference in risk of death between the two groups. The relative risk was exactly one. Um, and, and in fact, um, those who were randomized to the early um, RRT had um, a higher risk of RRT dependence at 90 days. Um, in terms of adverse events, there were more adverse, or there were equal adverse events between the two groups, or sorry, 
Um, there were more adverse events in the accelerated strategy, um, mostly driven by hypotension and hypophosphatemia. So don't wait until the AEIOUs get a nephrology consult early. There's still data that says that having nephrology on board reduces um, adverse um, kidney outcomes. And you probably want to, um, if you're kind of trying to determine whether or not to start dialysis, you probably want a nephrology opinion. So in summary, um, the START AKI was a large, well-powered trial in AKI demonstrating that accelerated strategy initiation of RRT did not improve mortality and that there was more RRT dependence and more adverse events. Um, this study was generalizable. It was multinational. It incorporated clinical equipoise and it included a very large number of participants, more than all of the other studies combined. But there, was lim there were limitations. Again, clinical equipoise is subjective. Um, there was concern for participant heterogeneity. And um, there was some concern that adverse event reporting may have been higher in the early start um, RRT because those folks were just on dialysis for longer. So in conclusion, we might have some practice shifts on the horizon in terms of our hepatorenal syndrome treatment. Um, and I'm just proud of the nephrology community for conducting START AKI because it's a really large and well-powered clinical trial. And um, thank you for your attention and I'm sorry to go a little bit over, over and sorry for the technical difficulties. <laughs> Anna, thank you very much. Um, I also, I apologize for the technical difficulty for your talk. I think because we are over, why don't we just uh, take questions up front if that's okay? Mm -hmm. All right, thanks everybody for coming. Appreciate it.